Uh, while we're having lunch, I've got, um, we've got a speaker that's going to talk about the rededication of Emancipation Park. She's, uh, I'll go ahead and give you a little background on her and let her be talking as you get your lunch. Um, her name is Algenita Scott Davis. She's vice, prayer, vice chair of the Tax Increment Reinvestment Zone, or TERS 7. She's a native Houstonian, lawyer, and a member of the Planning Commission. She's a degreed professional and is licensed by the State Bar of Texas Federal Courts and the United States Supreme Court. At present, she is visiting professor at Texas Southern University School of Business and Government. Also, she is a community affairs liaison for Central Houston Incorporated. She's held many board positions with volunteer organizations, but I will let her explain all those to you. Uh, Algenita. Well, I think it's uh, still morning, so I'll say good morning. I'm Algenita Davis, and I vice chair the Tax Increment Reinvestment Zone number seven. And you've probably heard a little bit about TERSAs if you're here in Houston, but basically they are instrumentalities of the city of Houston that are created to remove blight and to stimulate growth and economic development in areas within their boundaries that are designated by the city. Uh, I wanted to, one, thank you guys for allowing me to come and talk to you a little bit about a time that's kind of outside of your wheelhouse. It um, represents the Emancipation Park and the process that we're going through for its rededication. And to go back to talk to you a little bit about its history, because I know that's what you would be interested in, is Emancipation Park is a 10-acre site purchased in 1872 with funds raised by the Colored People's Festival and Emancipation Park Association. And this acquisition was led by community leaders Richard Allen, who was employed by the Freedmen's Bureau as an architect, uh, Reverend Elias Dibble, the first minister at Trinity United Methodist Church, Richard Brock, uh, the first of four men appointed by the governor as a city of Houston alderman, the first of four African Americans appointed by the governor as a city of Houston alderman, and Reverend John Henry Jack Yates, the first full-time pastor of Antioch Church. It is referred to as the first public space in the city of Houston and the city's longest standing public place dedicated as a park in the state of Texas. Uh, this location was established as a place for celebration of freedom of enslaved persons. Uh, to go back a little bit, of course, Texas is unique in its celebration of emancipation because, as you know, until forced to do so, the state of Texas, its slave owners and government refused to honor the Emancipation Proclamation, which was originally issued September of 1872 and became effective January of 1863. And it took the arrival of Union troops at Galveston again to recover Galveston, again to Union control, months after the conclusion of the Civil War to uh, force this Emancipation Proclamation to be um, uh, accepted. As we've learned, Union General Gordon Granger, accompanied by 2,000 Union troops, issued what's called General Order 3, which declared that the freedom of the approximate 250,000 enslaved persons in Texas would occur. The 13th Amendment, of course, passed by Congress on January 31st, 1865, did not become effective until December 6, 1865, when it was ratified by, by the states. So what was the effect of this Emancipation Proclamation other than decreeing that enslaved persons were to be free? It, it validated the Fugitive Slave Act of the Constitution and Fugitive Slave Acts of 1850 and other similar laws in many states. And although the proclamation did not free slaves in the Union states that remained slaveholding, 
and specifically exempted parts of the Confederate states that were under Union control, it deterred intervention and support of the Confederacy from those in Britain and France. So the Civil War officially ended in 1865 with the signing of the surrender of General Lee at Appomattox. I believe that the purchases of the 10-acre tract of land were committed to celebra celebrating all of these efforts and all of the benefits of freedom. And that's why they, wa they wanted to have a site that celebrated what really was a messy series of events but that did not occur just with one stroke of the pen. For example, we are reminded that this week, um, because of the celebration of the District of Columbia Emancipation Act, on, for, which was signed on April 16th, we have the reward of a lengthened time to turn in our tax returns until Monday, April 18th of 2016. In the district, North Carolina, and other places, of course, there were massive commemorations that were conspicuous and recurring. So these celebrations occurred very publicly throughout the nation and, of course, in Houston at, by the uh, Colored People's Festival Group at the Emancipation Park um, situation, the Emancipation uh, efforts. So they wanted a place to do this. And as such, they identified a place because of the migration of African Americans into the third ward of Houston, and they raised a sum of money through their churches and through their efforts of $800 and bought the 10 acres. So since that time, the park has been used for uh, very public celebrations. It had got into a little trouble back in uh, 1916, and it was, a, it was then um, because of their financial situation, because their celebrations were a little excessive and they didn't have the expenses to uh, really cover them, they were sued for the recovery of those monies and the court ruled and the appellate court supported in the lawsuit Wood versus Bell that in order to secure this as the dedicated place of celebration, the court then awarded the city of Houston and it became the trustee for Emancipation Park. So currently, Emancipation Park is undergoing a $34 million uh, revitalization pursuant to a master plan for the reconstruction of facilities that were finished in about 1939. And in 1939, the city had three buildings on the site. There were many, many activities that occurred there. I brought with me today just one that was done by my father-in-law in 1940 to have a celebration of an event at that location. They had conferences there, conventions at that location. It was used by the public broadly. Redevelopment of Emancipation Park supports an overall city community development strategy to reinvest and revive this long-standing community site. Support for this re revitalization includes that from Houston Endowment, the Kinder Foundation, Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, the City of Houston, and the Almeda OST Corridors Redevelopment Authority, known as Tourist Number 7. The planning and design for this project was done by the Freelon Group, which is a group that designed the National Museum on the Mall that's been done by the Smithsonian for dedication to African American history and culture. We are now seeking to make the, Afri the Emancipation Park as a designated National Heritage Corridor site. Texas is the largest and second most populous state in the nation and has a unique African American history. Its legacy, of course, is under Six Flags, and we've talked about a lot of that earlier. The designation of Emancipation Park would expose contributions of African Americans in Texas to many of those across the nation and around the world. So we are seeking to make this park a welcoming center for the heritage of emancipation and all of the acts, the decrees, and the laws and the proclamations that resulted in the emancipation of African Americans. I have left, um, I brought a picture of our proposed efforts a proposed uh, work that's being done right now, and we are well on the way. We're about 70% complete with the restoration of, our, of 
of Emancipation Park. And that big picture is outside. I've also brought a description of the events that will occur this time for Juneteenth, June 17th through the 19th. And I have handouts at the back so you could see that. And I also brought, uh, and, and Barbara Eves and I share a history of Texas Commerce Bank, Chase. I also brought some of the historical information that we had accumulated about African American history while I was at Chase. So thank you so much for letting me up you, update you on what's been happening at Emancipation Park. We would love to have your support, and by all means, keep up with us and what we're trying to do to make sure that emancipation continues to be a celebration in our city. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe we're going to start soon. It looks like the lunch line has all made it into the room. Uh, we have a very interesting luncheon speaker today. Um, as your program notes, Lee Spencer White is a seventh generation Texas who has a fourth grade grandfather who died at the Alamo. <clears throat> I've known Lee for around 20 years. Uh, most uh, uh, especially in her actions as a, uh, I started to say officer, maybe honcho would be better, uh, of the Alamo Defenders Descendants Association, the ADDA, not a 12-step organization, but <laughs> one that holds an evening service in the Alamo Chapel every year to celebrate those of their ancestors who died at the Alamo, and who bring very honored guests, such as occasionally myself, into, uh, into that service. Uh, it's, it was at one of those services where I first met one of our former speakers, Greg Dimmick, uh, who handed me a little canister ball that the Mexican Army had dropped in Wharton County many, many years ago. I have a lot of very dear memories about services in the Alamo Chapel uh, thanks to the ADDA. I was fortunate enough to be a reader, and they call us outside readers, I feel like an inside reader this time, for the University of Oklahoma Press when they sent me this manuscript, Joe, the slave who became an Alamo legend. And I thought, what can Lee possibly know about Joe that no one's ever been able to figure out before. And as she will show you, the answer is a lot. This book was just reviewed in the Southwestern Historical Quarterly, the most recent edition, October 2015. They're a little behind. And it's ref it is called in this review a masterpiece of research, and I think that's true. I'm not going to step on Lee's story by telling you the blockbuster surprise that comes in this book on Joe and his early life, his trip to the Alamo, and his life after the Alamo, but um, it is um, one of the most remarkable bits of historical research I've ever seen uh, and I was so pleased uh, that it was a dear friend uh, who was able with uh, Ron Jackson uh, to pull it off, uh, to research it, to write it, and now to talk about it. Lee Spencer White. Looks like I'm the uh, lunchtime entertainment or um, 
you know. Yeah, yeah, well, just don't go to sleep on me, folks. I'd really appreciate it. Uh, no, I, I think it was like 1995, um, I met this young man named Ron Jackson. And at that time, I was just putting together um, research trying to locate previously unknown Alamo defenders. So I had been going to some probate records and a few courthouses, and then I was also looking for descendants, people that had fallen through the cracks of history and no one knew about them. And so I'm green, I know nothing, so I'm just checking everywhere uh, for these people. And like I said, this young man comes up to me and says, well, you know, I am wanting to meet with families of these defenders because I want to put sort of an oral history together. And I said, very interesting. You know, who have you found? Here's what I have, let's, let's chat. And we became friends. And we would talk about different defenders because I'm doing this research in these courthouses. And I, by the way, I found two really um, interesting guys that are defenders and somehow they didn't make it to the land office. But in their probates, it says died at the Alamo. Uh, so <clears throat> anyway, we talked about different people that had been in the Alamo and, well, what do you know about that? I said, well, you know, the, really, the majority of the people in the Alamo, we know nothing about them. You know, you've got Bowie, Crockett, Travis, now we've got Seguin, Esparza, okay, you know, occasional Bonham, but what about all those other people? You know, how are we gonna find those people? And so we chat about it. He said, well, you know, um, that guy, Joe, you know, Travis is a um, manservant, and I said, yes. He said, uh, I said, yeah, I'd love, to, I'd love to find his family, put him on the front row. And he said, well, what do you think about us finding him and searching? I said, well, yeah, right. Um, what do we have here? Uh, he's an enslaved man by the name of Joe. Uh, he disappears, you know, in 1837 and nothing, we know nothing. Sure, piece of cake, we can find that guy. And uh, so, we continued to chat about it a little bit, and then in um, uh, like 97, we really start checking into it and thinking we probably wouldn't find too much. And so, you know, I guess I'll quote uh, uh, paraphrase Thomas Edison, who said, uh, you know, start with the last guy that, you know, researched something. You know, what do we know about him? What do these historians know about him? And uh, so we, Knew, let's see if I, uh, we knew about this gentleman, uh, William Fairfax Gray, who wrote a diary, mentioned Joe. Joe um, gives a report to the government. William Fairfax Gray has his opinions about Joe, very glowing. Okay, we know that. All the historians know that, okay? And can't see what I have over there. Um, so we're going through John Rice Jones' diary, ledger. Um, oh, and, oh, this is why I see what it is now. Um, this is Joe pointing out Travis's body. This would be what William, uh, William Fairfax Gray would be discussing. Um, uh, and, you know, again, we just d don't have very much. Um, we know what Susanna said. She was a survivor from the Alamo battle. We have the Travis diary, which was very interesting. I was like, okay, let's, everyone's read this though, Ron. I mean, what can, you know, how can we find anything? And then we find, the, the, it, which everyone knows again, the ad where uh, Joe um, takes off with a horse and with a, a, a previous Mexican soldier and disappears uh, out of the estate. So we know that. Uh, and then, oh, and there's another ad, uh, or not ad, but a newspaper article in Austin uh, that people thought was Joe, and we did too. We, you know, it says, old man servant of Travis, he should be in the parade, and then you don't find anything else. That's just it. So, okay, well, and later on we do find that guy, and it's not Joe. It probably is someone that, um, that, that Travis owned at one point uh, with a parcel of land that he obtained, I think from Kirkendall. But we do find the guy, we find his age, we find where he dies, that's why he's not in the parade later. Um, 
And so we're now we're looking at all these documents and feeling sort of depressed a little bit. You know, how can we find any of this? So um, as we're looking through the ledger and looking through the diary, we start seeing hints. Well, you know everyone's looked at that, Ron. You know they have. I mean, what could we possibly find they could? <clears throat> so I go back to that Edison thing, start in the beginning, where, who was the last person that did research? Well, there's really not any. I mean, there was just nothing there except these few little scant documents. So we're reading it, and it's like this Isaac Mansfield, okay? Well, who is this Isaac Mansfield? Everyone knows his name, this Isaac Mansfield. Uh, it's in uh, the Travis Diary. And it's saying that Job belonged to this Isaac Mansfield. And, you know, he's, he's, he, they're dropping a few names. And you're like, well, who is that? And Ron's like, well, where can we find this person? You know, how would we know? And I said, well, is he a citizen of the Republic? You know, maybe we ought to start there. You know, let's just go to, let's go to, the, to the heart of the colony. He's at the right time. You know, Travis is an attorney. He's working these deals. I said, you know... Insider deals, I'm telling you, we need to look at that too. <laughs> you never know, because people tend to take advantage of certain opportunities. So my feeling was, okay, he's an estate attorney. He's a probate lawyer. He is going to be um, in the center of when the estates are auctioned. He would have an opportunity to buy. We might look at that. So... We're not really optimistic, but we're thinking, hmm, we'll see, see what happens there. I said, well, let's, let's just call some counties and see what's in the probates. You know, I've been pretty lucky so far with these probates. No one seems to bother with these probates, and I have found them to be a gold mine. You open these files, and there's an inventory. When you die, they, they take an inventory of everything you own to pay off your creditors. I mean, it's absolute they have to have this inventory. I said, some of the probates have it, some of them don't. So I am finishing up a March 6th ceremony, and we've decided we're going to take off on a research, our very first research trip. So we head to the heart of the colony. We go to Belleville, and we ask for an Isaac Mansfield. Well, yes, we do have him in probate. You're kidding me. You have, you have an Isaac Mansfield? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So we sit down. I mean, how we, 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 our minds are still racing because how can we find this Isaac Mansfield so easy? You know, why has no one looked for him? And um, we sit down, and I love to tell this story because, and it's not just this courthouse, it, we found this across the board in courthouses. Um, young women working in the courthouse do not necessarily know history and actually really don't appreciate history. They're looking at their watch because their boyfriend's going to pick them up go eat lunch in a little bit. And you're bothering me, lady. So we sit down with, and it comes out really thick, this, this probate file. We're like, wow. So we're sitting here all excited, you know, we're kind of huddled up next to each other and uh, we're opening the pages. Yes, this is, this is the right, yes. And all of a sudden we see a document that has the information that we are seeking, which is putting a connection with Joe and, and, uh, and Cummings buying Joe is there, which of course we also thought insider deals. Who do you know? You know, who's your girlfriend? Who's your girlfriend's brother? You know, we're putting all that together and sure enough, that's what's happening. Um, Travis's girlfriend's brother bought Joe at the auction when Isaac Mansfield died. It says Isaac Mansfield it talks about, you know, St. Louis. Okay, okay, oh, St. Louis, okay. And we're, we're looking at this, and, and we see William Barrett Travis's original signature. We're like, oh, my God. Oh, my God, somebody's going to see this and take it away from us. You know, we need a copy before they know what, what we have. You know, we're, you're, we're waiting for the history police to fall down on us, you know. <laughs> and so, okay, we need this and this. And this. Oh, let's just copy the whole file. Okay. Um, this file is crumbling, has an old rusty paper clip, you know, holding it together. We're like, mm. so we, we're very careful these documents. Oh, we're holding it like this, and, and, and we have it all stacked, and we take it to this young lady. We're both looking at each other, holding our breath, thinking she's going to take it away from us. I know she's going to take it away from us. She looks at it, and she goes, 
I hate these old documents. They are so brittle and hard to Xerox. <laughs> Is it okay? Uh, uh, you know, to ourselves. And so we get our first really big break, which is this Isaac Mansfield. And, okay, now, Ryan and I know that we have to connect all the dots because it's showing this Cummings. But we need that little piece of paper, the slip of paper that says Cummings sells it to Travis. You know, we have to make that connection. Ron, how are we going to find that? It's not in here. Yeah, so, okay. Um, but we're real tickled with what we have. But we still don't know really much about this Isaac Mansfield guy. Okay, as in where he's from. Uh, <clears throat> I said, well, I think we need to. I'm always, goes, I always like to follow the money. I'm going to tell you straight up, I, I just feel like if you follow the money, you're going to find something. And so I thought, well, let's go to the estate. Well, well, no one had really put Travis's whole estate together. Well, I'm just flabbergasted. I'm like, well, I can't believe that they haven't put everything together. No, nope. there is a, what they would call his estate, but it's not the complete estate. So I travel around all the counties that I can find where he owned land. And I'm, tr you know, trying to put it all together. And I'm finding this, these inventories. And I'm finding um, where the executors are being changed. John Rice Jones, the original executor, uh, his wife dies. And then he ends up qu quitting, you know, uh, relinquishing his um, executorship. And another guy named J.B. Miller takes over. I'm like, wow, this thing just keeps going on, right? You know, and we're, I said, I think it's just going to keep going. You know, I, do estates go that long? Apparently they do. Wonder why they're doing this. Are they trying to save it for the kids? I mean, what's, what's happening? You know, so we have nine Julian questions, and we argue with one another, and we have, we talk to one another three, four times a day on the telephone, and my husband swears that if I sold books for 500 years, I'd never pay for my phone bills, you know. <laughs> no, we won't be going to the research trips because uh, we started then getting excited because we had this little tidbit of information on Isaac Mansfield. So now we're very bold. Now we're traveling to Louisiana and, you know, all these different places and all the courthouses. We're, we're hitting every courthouse that would be of the right time period and uh, finding a lot of information, a lot of nothing, too. But now we're starting to collect a file on all of these old um, uh, early colonists and especially trying to collect their probates. Maybe Travis had some kind of dealings with this guy. Okay, now we need to look at all the slave owners. <sighs> and who did they know? And who were they related to? So we've got more files now than J. Edgar Hoover. You know, we're just piling them up. Uh, we, we feel like we need to know everybody in the Republic of Texas so we can find our Joe. Because obviously, at some point in time, you know, he has to surface somewhere. And so, as we put the Travis estate together, pictures are starting to emerge. Now, I want to tell you about history. I do not have a degree in history, but one thing I have learned is it's a shifting sand under you. Never hang your hat on one kind of theory uh, because it will change. And one day we would have all of our little pieces laid out and we would think this. And two weeks later, we would be in Louisiana and find another tidbit. Uh, I'd pull up a ship record. Well, we found Travis's son who they somehow didn't find him on the ship. And they would see Charles Travis, age 30. Well, go to the original documents. Folks, if I can tell you anything in this world, it's go to the original documents. Do not rely on something you read, ever. And, you know, just because other people haven't found something doesn't mean it can't be found. There is a treasure trove of information out there. I just wish I could live three more lifetimes so I could see it all. Uh, it, oh, and by the way, if you hadn't noticed, this is addictive. <laughs> Very addictive. <laughs> you know, you got your little bucket, and you're like, oh, my God, I've got a new nugget, and this nugget. You know, every time you go to a new courthouse, you find something. And maybe it's not exactly on something on Joe, but it's on someone that knew him, or it's, you know, painting a bigger picture. Now, we're not trying in this book to define the Texas Revolution or even slavery. You know, we have this one enslaved man. We're trying to find his story. That's it. And by the way, 
There are not very many of those types of books out there. We start looking. Well, has this been done before? <laughs> You know, it, what are our odds? And most days we go, yeah, this is just not going to work. We, you know, uh, um, we'll, we'll never find very much on this. This is, this is not working. And then one day, our big break came. Um, of course, by the, in the meantime, we're always doing our theories. Did he, did he, did he you know, when he took off from uh, John Rice Jones's place, you know, where did he run? He probably went to Mexico, and yeah, that's probably right, because everybody says that. And You know, in the 1850s, you know, there was so many going there that Rip Ford had to go do this, and you know, you're, you're, because you're reading all this stuff, thing, and trying to find a clue somewhere, anywhere, you know, just so you're just reading mounds and mounds and mounds. Um, <clears throat> but our big break came on Christmas Eve. Ron is sitting, now he's sick too, by the way. Ron, you didn't hear me say that. Uh, he's sitting in the library in Oklahoma City reading about St. Louis. Because we're like, okay, well, this guy's from St. Louis. We're going to have to learn all about St. Louis. What's going on in St. Louis? And he sees a little book that he's reading through just because he's just blindly reading. And he sees Isaac Mansfield, Texas. And then he names off his brothers and sisters which are the same names that's on this probate record in Texas. Well, this is the same, this is, this is it, this is it. And the instruction to Ron was, listen, don't call me after nine o'clock unless you find Joe. Then you call me at 3.30 in the morning, no problem. Okay. He's like, should I call, should I not call? You know, because this book that we discovered, or he discovered, by just, again, reading everything you can read. So yes, uh, in researching, it's still there see the originals, and believe you me, it's not always in an index. You sometimes you just have to read everything in the, in the room. And as he's doing that, he picks it up, and it's William Wells Brown, the very first African-American novelist in America, an abolitionist, you know, contemporary of, of Frederick Douglass, and we're like, this can't be right. You know, you can't even make this stuff up. You know? And this is Joe's brother. This is his brother. He's saying, my family, my brother was sold, and my mother, and he's naming them, and they went with this Isaac Mansfield of Texas. And we're just like, oh, my God, this is, this is. And in the book, of course, now it gives us Joe's history because he discusses his childhood. He, he discusses all the horrors that happen. He discusses his genealogy. He discusses, you know, all of, uh, all the children were from different fathers. So uh, he names his father, which was a Mr. Higgins, and we re researched Mr. Higgins. And up until his current descendants, we have file on them too, <laughs> so, um, who are judges in, in Alabama today. Um, I don't know that he knows about this book. But, <laughs> but uh, that was very fascinating. And early on, we decided that we would try to write something different than the, the typical history book because, A, we wanted people to actually buy it, and, and a lot of people don't like history. I'm sure none of you are like that, but a lot of people don't like history. We found that out, too. And um, so we thought, well, it needs to be interesting. But we, first of all, we have to find something. But it needs to be interesting. And... And we're not going to censor anything. And we're going to be true to what we think. Because I'm going to tell you out here, as you all know, you can line up every source you want to line up, and I can shoot a hole in yours, and you can shoot a hole in mine. I mean, you know, it, it, you get a room full of historians, and not two of them agree on everything. So we decided just to do what we really felt like uh, was our truth and, you know, choose our sources. Um, but we wanted to be true to it. I'm not going to censor anything. Well. As soon as we got to William Wells Brown portion of who his grandfather was, we went, uh oh, we're in trouble. Um, he's, he's very clear on it. Now, you know, whether people want to believe what these people say, I believe every word, but that's me. You know, um, not everyone agrees. But when he says his father is Higgins and you, you, you start looking at where Higgins is, okay, that works. He's a nephew visiting, you know, this Dr. Young. And um, in St. Louis, Marthasville, and um, everything he says seems, it all checks out. So it was like, well, why would he lie about this particular thing? Well, this particular thing that I'm going towards is he says, Daniel Boone was my grandfather. 
I was like, oh. what are the odds of you finding the first African American novelist being related, brother, to Joe in the Alamo, and their grandfather Daniel Boone? You know, it's just like, so. Um, Anyway, we put that in the book. Uh, you know, it's what William Wills Brown said, and we're saying it too. Um, so anyway, is, is we now we're getting sort of excited. But okay, we've got his first part of his life. Well, the second part is just going to be impossible. So we're making phone calls and sending out information. I contact the Alamo. I said, listen, anybody, everybody that comes to the Alamo, because I'm also looking for other descendants. Um, Make a list and get their address and their telephone number. Especially if, if anything comes in about Joe. They knew I was looking for, for Joe's descendants and Joe, something, anything about Joe. Well, there's a gentleman called from Austin. And he said, my name is um, Leonard, is the last name. And he said, uh, in my family, my grandfather said that our great-grandfather was Joe in the Alamo. I said, really? Well, tell me more about this. Well, he was a free man. I was like, well, he's not. Mm. But, but tell me more. I, I didn't tell him, you know, anything. I just said, well, tell, tell us more. And so he tells us a st long story about this little boy named Levy in New Orleans. And, and so, but, you know, I'm going to go down every rabbit hole. I'm going to check out every story. It could, you know, it could be somebody that, that is something to do with this story. And, um... Well, I immediately find out it's some Leonard Brothers out of Grapeland. That's where these people descend from. And we had to tell him that. He was not happy. He is happy now, though. He's called and said, you were right. <laughs> and um, everything's good there. Well, then I interview this Mr. Clyde Glosson, whose son was a very uh, famous football player in California. And uh, Mr. Glosson says, well, my grandmother, who I met, she was very old, he said, uh, scary. <laughs> she was old and ugly and scary. And, you know, he, I think he was like six. And he said, um, well, she came to Texas with, with Travis. Where really? <laughs> Tell me more about this. So I go do a long interview, which turns out, and I won't get into it, but it's the most fabulous interview in the whole world. I, you know, did I get joy out of it? No. But the man gave me an insight into a time period in his life that was fascinating. And I had to, at that point, ask a few sensitive questions because he would tell me uh, or, or hint towards something. And I finally said, well, Mr. Uh, Glosson, are you trying to say something about sex? Because if you are, just go ahead and say it. Were they having an affair? Did, you know, somebody's children? Well, yes, ma'am. And his son, the football player, almost fell off the couch because he didn't know this information. So we need to really interview our elders and ask them difficult questions. Um, but it, it, as, as time went by, Ron's wife answered the telephone in Oklahoma and at that point uh, said, Ron, Darth Vader is on the line. And it was James Earl Jones calling. And and because we had sent out a message uh, a, a, about some information that he had. He said his adopted brother was descended from Joe. Well, we've got to ask. You know, we're going to go down another rabbit hole, but we're going to have to ask. So he's calling. He's saying, well, you know, I really don't think so. But there was some discussion, but I, 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 I just, he's basically retracting it, you know, saying, I, I don't really think so. Um, so we've met some interesting people in this journey, wonderful people. We've made cold calls across, you know, at least five states, uh, traveled to all these states. We get a hint, oh, there's Travis's ex-wife married a Dr. Cloud. Okay, let's look at that ship record. Uh, well, they weren't trying to get back together. I don't know who, who started that little legend, but she's got her fiancé on that ship with her. Well, that doesn't sound like you're trying to reconcile to me when she's delivering that little boy and has a little girl with her. And so we're finding about all these people, all these little tidbits are just fascinating. And so as we travel along with this, um, and again, this is 11 years of 40-hour-a-week research and traveling. My daughter is a freshman in college this year, and we started when I was pregnant with her. 
So longevity is important to research. Determination is, is important to research. Don't ever give up because it was days that, you know, it was like, we're throwing in the towel. No, no, don't do that. Don't do that. And so in this book, and I'm not, you know, go through the whole book with you, but what I wanted, want really to emphasize is that when you do research, you, like I said, you look at the original document. When you do research, you need to keep an open mind, not necessarily even what you know, and um, and keep some common sense about you because people, times change, people don't, okay? So if you think somebody might be in a position that he might benefit himself, he probably is. So you need, you know, you need to look at that. But um, as we traveled along, again, now we were getting to the point where we've got Joe up to the Alamo, pretty much. Now what happened to him? Well, did he go to Mexico? Well, did he go to Alabama? Oh, hell no, that does not not um, not an option, you know, that he would even dare go to, to um, Mexico. But we looked at that. And then as we started looking at the um, information coming from Alabama, all the legends, we said, well, let's take a trip to Alabama. Let's, you know, let's check this out. Everyone said there's no information in Alabama that has not been checked out. So the first thing we do is go to the courthouse, and I thought, well, it looks like they're right. There's nothing here. You know, we have this divorce decree. This is a state divorce decree. It's not, uh, there's no papers in the county courthouse. But I see a book that says orphan records. I open it up. There's no index. So I sit down and just read the whole thing. Found Travis's two children in there and the executors. And it shows it goes up until the 1850s, you know, when they're coming to Texas. So this the executorship has lasted. In Texas, the estate records are lasting until these kids are grown. I mean, we're talking like 25 years. You know, 20, it's a long time. So at that point, we go to the, the little library, and, um, and I'm reading what everybody else has read, and I find this one little scrap of paper, and it's a woman says, well, it's no wonder that Travis left her after all what she did. And I found four or five things of what, whatever she did. And they never said, well, what did she do? Tell me, what did, what did she do? Well, she, the second sentence is, no wonder he got custody of the kids. What? Had, what? He got custody of the kids? Well, let me check that out. So I got in the car and drove to Dallas County, Alabama, where I knew the executor who had died in Texas, which is the brother of his divorced wife, uh, his estate would be. And I thought, maybe it's there. I don't know. We just got in the car. It, we have no clue. Got there. Sure enough, book, book one. You know, I mean, it was on one of the first pages. And it shows his estate. Okay, well, let's look at this estate. So it says... Um, that he is appointing these two young nephews as executors of the children in case something happens to him. He then goes on and says, um, "We, uh, you know, he says, I want to see to it that the children are educated. Here's so much money. And here's to my wife so much money. Here's to my brother so much. And here's to my sister, Rosanna. That's Travis's ex-wife. Well, if a woman is alive, she would have custody of those children if she had originally had custody. So obviously she did not have custody. She's alive. He is now telling the courts to have these two young men be the executors, and that's what sticks. So now we're going to track her. What happened to her? Well, we track her to Louisiana. The history books have all said, well, she died, and, you know, well, no, she didn't die. She moves with this Dr. Cloud to Louisiana, has two children with him, the baby dies. The older one lives to be eight years old. So now I'm down on a back bayou in Louisiana in a cemetery. You know, we check out everybody. And by the way, Dr. Cloud's estate is this thick and it's in perfect condition. We know every carriage he owned. Um, so again, it's it's following step after step after step. So now we're <clears throat> we're still in Alabama, and we get a phone call. This guy calls us and says. Because we, we still don't have a clue where Joe went to. We thought, you know, I'd already checked all the Mexican records. I'd been to the border towns. I, I just was like, he's just disappeared. I, I don't know. 
So we get a phone call from Alabama, and this guy says, you're going to think I'm crazy. Try me. Try to try me. He said, in the 40s, in the 1940s, there was an old man who lived in a pump house behind this family's house, and he slept in a chair, which now I just slept in a chair. Okay, a chair. And probably he was so old, I guess he couldn't lay down. I don't know, but he sat in this chair. And he said he used to tell us about the Alamo. I said, and what year was this again? Because I'm thinking, oh, it's uh, Fess Parker. Thing. Nope, prior to Fess Parker craze. Little bitty town in Alabama. And it's in Bruton, Alabama. That's where this is happening. And so he proceeds to tell us, well, he said that his, he was Joe. And I said, well, you know, that's not, unless he's Methuselah, it's not Joe. <laughs> and, but, you know, tell me the rest of the story. So he goes on to tell us that, that this old gentleman Kids loved him because he told these stories. Okay, and he told that he fought in the Alamo and that he came on the railroad tracks to where he is now. Well, Ron, there's no railroad tracks. There's no no railroad tracks in Texas, and uh, so that I don't know. I don't understand where this man's coming from. But let me check on that, because every time we'd find a new clue, we'd do, well, let me check on that. You know, let's see, see, see some maps, see some history, what can we find? Well, sure enough, they're already cutting the roads from Texas to Alabama. So the roads are cut, but, you know, there's no track laid. Oh, that's very interesting. And so let me see if I can move this along. Um, he, that's what, this is uh, John Rice Jones' track and Joe. And here is the, the, the document showing that uh, Joe was sold, is, and he's in the estate of Isaac Mansfield. And this is St. Louis. This would be looking down, Joe's perspective looking down onto the river. And this is William Wells Brown, the brother, the famous brother, um, the first American novelist, uh, African-American novelist. And he traveled the world. I, I, I even did a little research in Paris on him. Um, and this is the guy. This is Ben Riley. Now, we're not telling you that this is Joe's descendant. We're not telling you anything like that. But we just had to add this Alabama stuff because it's just so interesting. And, um, but this Ben Riley, when you go back, the plantation, the Riley plantation, the Travis plantation are next to one another. And the fact that he's pre-Fess Parker is very interesting. Again, we're not swearing anything. We're just going, isn't that interesting? Um, and we pulled his death record. Uh, and we've actually tried to put out feelers for some of his descendants. I'm still waiting for descendants to come forward. I'm waiting for somebody to pick up this book and say, this person is my ancestor. So we're looking for that. Um, and we keep faith that that will happen, that, we'll, that we will find all of the answers that we could possibly find on, on Joe. Um, like I said, it's been a, a wonderful experience uh, tracking him looking for him, looking for his family. I mean, we have, um, he's just part of our family. I cried when we finally had to finish the book because I, I didn't want to quit. I was like, no, I'm almost there. I almost got this. I, I swear I almost got this. You know, and if at some point in time you're like, we've got to wrap this up. You know, we're going to die with this manuscript in our, our possession. So it's, like I said, been a wonderful journey, and I wanted to share one more thing with you that is a product of this book, really. This is me inside the vaults of Mexico uh, in the Chapultepec Castle, and that flag is the flag that flew over the Alamo. That is the New Orleans gray flag, and I'm standing with the director uh, of, the, of the museum and had a wonderful private tour and then got to go into the vaults. I was like, that was the most exciting thing to do. And so I wanted to share that for those of you who have not been inside the vaults of the castle. Uh, it was a, a wonderful, wonderful experience. And I really uh, thank Joe really for this and the research for this because we probably wouldn't have ventured out uh, beyond our comfort zone, uh, except that after a while when you've talked to everybody that you can possibly talk to, um, cold call people, and, and talk to Darth Vader, I mean, <laughs> what do you have to lose anymore? 
So we still end the book with, like I said, research, boots on the ground, and you know, if Ron and I can find this information, so can you. And we really keep the faith in that, and we encourage people to research because it is hard work, but it can be done. So I, you know, I'm hoping that someone will pick up this Joe book and have that same attitude of what do we know, and let's start there. Thank you. Well, welcome back. And um, I'd like to start by saying that I am not Jim Crisp. Um, and, uh, but I am the, uh, I have been uh, kind of uh, assigned over the last couple of years, I've acquired the role of uh, co-moderator and I'm, I'm happy to do it. Um, I'm director of the Center for the Study of the Southwest, and, and we've been uh, helping to co-sponsor this event from uh, far off San Marcos, Texas. Uh, but uh, we, think, uh, we think it's a very worthwhile uh, program, um, and it, it is a, a volunteer effort of sorts. Um, all the people on the committee, I'd like to thank them again. Uh, they've been so wonderful, especially the last few years as we've, as we've stretched the boundaries of the Battle of San Jacinto uh, to include all kinds of things that, that make, in a way, the battle uh, more meaningful by setting it into, into a historical context uh, that um, previously was rather narrowly defined um, in military uh, terms and in strictly political terms. But as, as you've heard today, and as those of you who might look into uh, the Conservancy's um, archive of presentations from previous years, um, we have looked at the lives um, and experiences of Tejanos uh, before, during, and immediately after the battle. Uh, we have looked at the indigenous presence in Texas and how it affected outcomes. Uh, as you heard earlier today, they continue to uh, affect outcomes in ways that, that have not previously been explored. So all of the, all of the things that we've been doing um, tell us that uh, there are all kinds of facets uh, to, the, to the history of the uh, uh, Mexican Revolutionary and Republic era Texas um, that we that we are still exploring as we get beyond uh, the, um, I'll, I'll just use the traditional term, the great men approach uh, to that history. Uh, not that we shouldn't continue to pay attention to them, it's just that there are very many more participants in the events. It is such a rich history that I think we uh, are, um, our predecessors, um, and to a degree ourselves, but hopefully not our children and, and grandchildren, uh, have not been exposed to the richness of the history of that period. And I hope that's something that uh, this symposium contributes to. Um, my, uh, my first introduction today, um, Jeff Dunn, who's, who's going to talk about uh, Emily West at the Battle of San Jacinto. Somebody asked me this morning to provide a translation for the Texans here, so San Jacinta. <laughs> and um, was she the yellow rose uh, and really uh, in Santa Ana's tent, um, is brought to us by uh, a man who has made an avocational career of studying the Battle of San Jacinto. If you want to know anything about that campaign, the person to ask is Jeff Dunn. Um, he's covered uh, many bets in his education, actually. Um, a BA in economics from A&M, an MA in public affairs from UT, and uh, a school of public affairs, and then a JD from SMU. So, so um, he's, got, he's got friends in many parts of Texas. Um, he made uh, the cut as best lawyers in America in banking law and Texas's best lawyers for a number of years. Um, that's an impressive achievement because um, there, there, the, there's a fairly deep uh, lawyerly community in, in the Lone Star State. But it's his other career 
that interests us. Uh, aside from being a founder of the, uh, again, San Jacinto uh, Symposium, uh, Jeff has written extensively about the battle, uh, the subject of his talk today in, in that very special way. Uh, his commitment to revolutionary era Texas history includes authoring some of the Texas State historic, uh, uh, historical markers on the road between Gonzales and uh, San Jacinto. Um, he has uh, written a couple, uh, and if you get a chance to read the article on Emily West in the Handbook of Texas Online, it is just a, uh, no. Well, no, I'm sorry, the Yellow Rose article, the Yellow Rose article. Not the Emily was, uh, but he corrects the Emily uh, West article. Um, but the Yellow Rose art, uh, article is his. Uh, it's, it's a masterful job of, of uh, sleuthing of the popular culture behind uh, the, the story of the song and uh, how it got connected uh, to the myth of, of um, Emily. Uh, like most of us on the program today, uh, he's an active member of the Texas State Historical Association, uh, the San Jacinto Conservancy, uh, which has in fact named him a hero of uh, San Jacinto. So, Jeff. Thank you, Frank. Um, also like to uh, <clears throat> thank the volunteers of the San Jacinto Battleground Conservancy. Um, in addition to holding the symposium every year, the Conservancy does a, a magnificent job in trying to help preserve uh, the battlefield, the integrity of the battlefield. It's a very important objective, and those of you who are interested in those kinds of things, I encourage you to look at the website <clears throat> and consider joining and participating in that effort. As uh, Frank mentioned, um, my talk today is focusing on the Battle of St. Jacinto, and in particular, a story about the battle <clears throat> that is widely circulated in popular media today. And this story is about what really may have affected the outcome of the battle. Could it, could it have been uh, that the, the story of Santa Ana being distracted by a mulatto girl named Emily, who was in Santa Ana's tent precisely at the moment the Texans attacked the Mexican camp? Now, the term mulatto was a word used in the 19th century to denote a person who had white, a one white parent, one black parent, <clears throat> or a mixture of that. Um, but uh, getting back to the, to the story itself, what difference does it make and what is really the significance of this? And I can sum that up in the words of Bob Tutt, the former Texana columnist of the Houston Chronicle, who said that this story was arguably the juiciest story in Texas history. So from there, let's take a let's take an overview of the Battle of San Jacinto. And we'll start with exactly what happened. On the afternoon of April 21st, 1836, near where Buffalo Bio joins the San Jacinto River, the Texas Army under Sam Houston marched across an open field and attacked the Mexican Army under General Santa Ana. And according to most accounts, it took the Texans less than 20 minutes to attack and capture Santa Ana's camp. During the remainder of that afternoon, frightened Mexican soldiers threw down their guns and fled for their lives. By dusk, nearly half of the 1,200 or so men in Santa Ana's division were killed and about 700 taken prisoners. There were only about nine Texan dead and about 23 wounded, including Sam Houston. And although it was a, a brief battle involving only about 2,000 men, San Jacinto became recognized as a pivotal event in North American history. Those living in the 19th century pointed to San Jacinto as the decisive battle that ended Mexican sovereignty over Texas, helped establish the independent Republic of Texas, and, and eventually led to the annexation of Texas to the United States and the acquisition of territory all the way to the West Coast. And what makes San Jacinto particularly unusual is, as battles go, is that the defeated General Santa Ana was captured the following day and brought before Houston and there spent the next week with his tent side by side with Sam Houston's tent on the battlefield. 
<clears throat> something like this has rarely occurred in military history. In fact, it probably has never occurred since then uh, in any battle anywhere in the world, at least I'm not aware of that, which makes this battle particularly interesting. The fact that the two commanders were there ensconced together uh, for that long period of time. A few days after the battle, Sam Houston wrote his report to the Texan government. He did not rationalize the victory by accusing Santa Ana of being unprepared or by uh, him being an, an, an inadequate opposing commander. <clears throat> Instead, he attributed the Texan victory to the valor of his officers and his men. Santa Ana was kept a prisoner of the Texans for the next seven months. And in November of 1836, he was moved around to Galveston, Velasco, and Brazoria. But in November of 1836, he was escorted to Washington, D.C., had an audience with President Andrew Jackson. Uh, the Americans put him on a, on a U.S. vessel, and he was taken back to Veracruz, where he uh, lived. And he, at that point, in March of 1837, he finally had a chance to give his side of the story in, in a couple of letters that he wrote to the, Texan gov to the Mexican government and the people of Mexico. In those letters, he did not take responsibility for his defeat or excuse it on grounds of Texan valor. Instead, he said the loss was a result of the insubordination of his officers. If they had only followed his orders, he said, the battle would have turned out differently. But Santa Ana did admit that he was sleeping deeply when the battle started because he was not expecting the Texans to attack his camp that afternoon. In his words, the evil had been done by the time he realized what was happening, and it was too late for his orders to have any effect in rallying his men. So was there another explanation for the outcome of this battle that neither Sam Houston, or that both Sam Houston and Santa Ana may have had knowledge of, but never disclosed publicly? Now we get into Emily. Well, to get to the bottom of this, we have to start with the source of this remarkable story. And for this, we have to go to the Newberry Library in Chicago. The Newberry holds some of the unpublished papers of William Bollard. Bollard was an Englishman who at age 35 came to Galveston in 1842, six years after the battle. <clears throat> Between 1842 and 1844, Bollard lived and traveled in the populated portions of Texas taking extensive notes of the people he met, the places he visited, and the culture and social life of Texas. The Bollock papers at the Newberry include his Texas journals and diaries, as well as two unpublished essays, one entitled Texas in 1842, and the other entitled A Personal Narrative of a Residence and Travels in Texas. When Bollard returned to England in 1844, he began publishing articles about Texas, including such topics as Texas geography, botany, hunting, Indians, natural history, and political history, and he sometimes commented on the Battle of San Jacinto. But he never published anything concerning the story of Emily's uh, sojourn in Santa Ana's tent. Uh, but we know he heard about it because the source of the story comes from a passage in the unpublished essay called Entitled Texas in 1842, where Bollard narrates a trip that he took from Galveston to Houston by steamboat. <clears throat> and he, he wrote, on the 6th of July, I left Galveston for part of eastern Texas. Steaming across the bay in a few hours, having passed the battlefield of San Jacinto, I arrived at Houston. Much has been written in relation to the celebrated battle in which the flower of the Mexican army perished and when Santa Ana was made prisoner. But I beg to introduce the following as given to me by an officer who was engaged in it, given in his own words. And here he quotes, the Battle of San Jacinto was probably lost to the Mexicans owing to the influence of a mulatto girl, Emily, belonging to Colonel Morgan, who was closeted in the tent with General Santa Ana at the time the cry was made, the enemy, they come, they come, and detained Santa Ana so long that order could not be restored readily again. Now, if you look carefully at this transcript, which I have on the screen, off to the left is the word private underlined three times. 
It's not clear if Bollert wrote that or somebody else, but we know this story was never published during his lifetime. And this unpublished story, original manuscript, <clears throat> is the sole source of the story of Emily and Santa Anna's tent. There's no published account of the story in any 19th century source. And every story that you've read about Emily can be traced to this passage and only this passage. Now, Bollert died in 1876, and his Texas journals, together with the two unpublished essays and other materials, were placed at auction in London in 1902. And as it happened, the buyer was an American. His name was Edward Ayer. He was a philanthropist, and he made a fortune selling lumber to American railroads in the 19th century. And he decided to spend his money on collecting books and manuscripts, not unlike some of us today. Uh, and fortunately for us, uh, one, his collecting interest was the American West and Indians. But fortunately for us, he took an interest in Bollard's papers and was a high bidder. And in 1911, he donated most of his collections, including the Bollard papers, to the Newberry Library. And it took about 20 years after that before Texas historians began to notice this treasure trove of material about the Republic of Texas. The first to use the collection was Joseph Schmitz, who was a brother in the Catholic Society of Mary and who taught history for many years at St. Mary's University in San Antonio. His book entitled, Thus They Live, Daily Life in the Republic of Texas, was published in 1936 and was the first to use Bollard's papers extensively. A similar book published by William Ransom Hogan in 1946 also used the Bollard papers extensively, but neither Smith nor Hogan nor anyone else who reviewed the papers either noticed the story about Emily or they saw it but intentionally decided not to publish it or quote it. But there was one historian who could not resist it. His name was Joe Franz, uh, a very well-known history professor at the University of Texas. And he noticed this while writing his PhD dissertation on Gail Borden, the inventor of condensed milk in the 1940s. He went to the Newberry Library, he saw the story, and even though it really had nothing to do with Gail Borden, uh, he nonetheless inserted it in his thesis as a footnote, <clears throat> uh, in, in, as a commentary to when Borden happened to have met J James Morgan. And in this footnote, was, it was retained in the book that was published in 1951, and he wrote, Morgan's mulatto girl, Emily, is supposed to have been in Santa Ana's tent when the Texans attacked and have detained the general so long that he emerged from his tent too late to restore order. So we see for the first time, the incident is published, 1951, and frankly, it gains very little notice. Um, it, he wanted to, edit the Bollard papers. France was so enthralled with it. Uh, but the University of Oklahoma professor, Gene Holland, beat him out. Uh, Holland <coughs> spent several years trying to decipher and organize Bollard's papers, and finally published William Bollard's Texas in 1956, which is still regarded today as one of the great classics of Texas history. Holland also saw the story about Emily, and, but he too relegated it to a footnote. But that was enough to finally gain the attention of amateur historians. <clears throat> Through the efforts of Texas A&M publicist Henderson Shuffler and folklore musician John Lomax Jr., they convinced Dallas Morning News Texana columnist Frank X. Tolbert that the story of Emily of the Battle, according to Shuffle, Shuffler may have actually uh, was worthy of being uh, included in the history of the battle, and that this unsung heroine of the battle, as, Huff, as Shuffler referred to her, may have actually been sung about after all in the form of the Yellow Rose of Texas, which coincidentally was a song that was very popular in the 1950s. We know now that the story really did not inspire that song, and for details, I'll refer you to the Handbook of Texas article that Frank mentioned that Jim Lutzwaller and I uh, co-wrote. Uh, but nonetheless, this connection between Emily and the Yellow Rose has been so ingrained that she's now become part and parcel of the story and will probably never be able to, to separate out the two. 
When Tolbert made this connection in his book in 1961 entitled An Informal History of Texas, this legend was now born out of Bollard's anecdote. And at this point, our story takes off in two tra trajectories. The first is how the story evolved over time and became popularized, starting out with speculation that Emily must have been a very attractive, if not seductive, person, and certainly a slave of this Colonel Morgan, and therefore was assigned his surname and became Emily Morgan. <clears throat> But uh, and the, no the notoriety of this Emily Morgan was exhibited in a number of ways. One was the hotel in San Antonio across the street from the Alamo became the Emily Morgan Hotel, even though she never came anywhere near San Antonio during her lifetime. <laughs> An English teacher at Sam Houston State, Martha Ann Turner, attempted to create a scholarly link between Emily and the song in, in, 19 in her book published in 1976 and she attributed the lack of any mention of the story in our Texas history books to male chauvinism, a term that was used by the feminist movement in the 1970s. She said that male historians just couldn't fathom that the real hero of San Jacinto was not Sam Houston, but this mulatto girl, Emily, that no one really talks about. We also see the story illustrated in novels. Several novels have been written a cartoon book has been written about her. There's a statue in Houston to Emily Morgan. <clears throat> and my friend Jim Lutzwater even put together and created and distributed a gag postcard, a spoof on Harry McCardle's painting of the Battle of San Jacinto, where he focuses on the battle and commissioned an artist to paint a bewildered looking woman peering out the tent in the middle of the battle. But the coup de grace was last year when Texas Rising <laughs> was produced. And we see that the screenwriters decided that Emily was the centerpiece of the entire San Jacinto campaign <laughs> and that the rivalry between Sam Houston and Santa Ana was over her affection. <clears throat> so you could write an entire thesis on how the story has been interpreted and maligned. But for this symposium, I want to focus on the second trajectory that took place after Tolbert's book came out in 1961. And that is that the story became a throwdown challenge to researchers on the Battle of San Jacinto. Was this story true? Could it be true? Was there any evidence to corroborate the story? Well, to answer this question, there are three individuals mentioned in the story. There's a Colonel Morgan, there's an Emily, and then there's Santa Ana. So first we'll look at Morgan. There was one Colonel Morgan in the Texas Revolution, and his name was James Morgan. That's pretty, pretty clear. Morgan was an interesting and well-educated man. He was born in Philadelphia. He spent his early years in North Carolina. He moved to Florida and then to Texas in 1830. When he came to Texas, he brought with him 18 slaves. Two documents survive with the names of these slaves. None of them are named Emily. <laughs> Interestingly enough, one of them, named Nancy, did take his surname, and she became Nancy Morgan. But there was never a woman named Emily Morgan. In 1834, with financial backing from a group of investors residing in New York City, Morgan purchased a 1,600-acre tract of land known as Clopper's Point, which is a peninsula separating the mouth of the San Jacinto River and Upper Galveston Bay. Today, the site is called Morgan's Point, named after Colonel Morgan. Morgan started to lay out a town at the site and called it New Washington. He had ambitions that this town would one day become the metropolis and capital of Texas. And in fact, it might have been the Houston of the future. That's what he was envisioning. To get this town growing, he needed skilled workers, trading vessels, and merchandise. And for this, he needed money. So he returned north in April 1835 to start the process arriving first at New Haven, Connecticut. While in New Haven, he purchased two schooners with the assistance of 
John P. Austin, who was a cousin of Stephen F. Austin and who lived in New Haven. He also advertised in the local newspaper for workers willing to relocate to Texas. This advertisement offered permanent employment for house carpenters, ship carpenters, blacksmiths, and various laborers with free passage to Texas. Later that summer in 1835, he traveled to New York City where he started to buy merchandise and again, advertises in a New York newspaper for skilled workers. In October 1835, the investors organized the new Washington Association and subscribed $60,000 in capital for the venture. Most of these investors, including New York pork collector Samuel Swartout, were from New York City, but there were also a few from Mexico City, including Lorenzo de Zavala. James Morgan was the only Texan subscriber, <clears throat> and he was appointed the Texas agent for the association. Now Morgan later wrote that he hired and brought to Texas 13 workmen, four servants, and quote, a lady for a housekeeper, unquote. And this is where a little serendipity comes into play and in how my personal involvement with Emily got started. And this happened in 1991 when I was an attorney here in Houston representing a local bank. And I was called by that bank to work on a loan transaction that was secured by a group of historical Texana documents. I reviewed those documents and realized that the collection was the remnant of a group of documents amassed by the late William Philpott, who died in 1971. And working my way through that collection, I started seeing a number of business papers signed by Morgan and found six employment contracts or indentures entered into by Morgan in October 1835, one of whom was a free black named Webster Augustus, who was from New Haven, Connecticut, and five others from New York. And one of these was a contract for Emily D. West of New Haven, Connecticut, and James Morgan of Texas. This, this remarkable document links Morgan, the earliest document that links Morgan with a woman named Emily, and is the earliest known record that we have of Emily D. West. So could this be the mulatto girl who belonged to Colonel Morgan, according to Bollard's account? So I'll read you this contract. It reads, this agreement made it in, entered into between Emily West of New Haven, Connecticut of the one part and James Morgan of Texas of the other part, witnesses that the said West hereby binds herself that she will go out in Morgan's vessel to Texas and there work for Morgan in any kind of housework she said West is qualified to do and to industriously pursue the same from the time she commences until the end of 12 months and not quit or leave Morgan's employ after she commences work for him at any time whatever without Morgan's consent until the end of 12 months aforesaid, said Morgan hereby binding himself to take West out to Texas on his vessel free of expense and to set West to work within one week after she gets there, if not sooner. West, Morgan agreeing to pay West at the rate of $100 per year, said wages to be paid every three months if requested. There are some interesting features about this contract. First, it's signed by Emily D. West and James Morgan. And secondly, it's also countersigned by a man named Simeon S. Jossen, who was white and was also from New Haven and served as a minister to New Haven's first black church. He was also a prominent and outspoken abolitionist at a time when abolitionists were considered the radical fringe, even in the North. The implication of his signature is that he knew Emily, and since they were both from New Haven, it was plausible that Emily may have been a member of his church. There's nothing here, though, to indicate that she was a woman of color, but that, but that certainly creates a strong inference that she, that she could have been because of his signature. <clears throat> Fortunately, all of these contracts were preserved along with the other documents in that Philpott collection and sold to the University of Texas at Arlington where they're now preserved today. So Morgan took these workmen, servants, and Emily, transported them on his vessels to Texas in November of 1835. And they arrived in New Washington in late December. They were immediately put to work. They started erecting structures, handling cargo for uh, shipments going back and forth to New Orleans. New Washington was becoming the town 
that Morgan dreamed it would be. Emily and the others arrived, though, during the middle of the Texas Revolution. Only a few weeks later, Santa Ana's forces entered Texas. The Alamo falls. Texas declares independence at Washington on the Brazos. Moves the seat of government to Harrisburg on Buffalo Bayou, which is very close to New Washington. Morgan is now appointed colonel and given command of Galveston Island. He takes some of his workmen with him, but leaves many of his slaves, his free black servants and others at New Washington to assist government officials and others escaping from the Mexican army. Meanwhile, the Mexican army and Sam Houston's army move eastward toward Harrisburg and Galveston Bay. There's Simeon Jawson, and there's a map of current Harris County showing the convergence of the armies. Santa Ana's men occupy New Washington April 17th through 20th, and according to Dr. George Patrick, who managed to escape just as the Mexican cavalry arrived, the Mexicans, in his word, captured all the servants and other individuals who happened to be there at the time. Santa Ana burned New Washington on April 20th, marched toward Lynch's Ferry, where he encountered Houston's army and the Battle of San Jacinto. One of Morgan's servants from New Haven was a free black named George Cooper. He was only 13 years old in 1836, but he later recalled that he was one of those captured at New Washington and that he was taken by the Mexicans to San Jacinto where he experienced the battle behind Mexican lines and survived it and was told to go home after the battle was over. So was Emily there too? Well, I mentioned previously that Santa Ana, when he returned to Mexico and wrote about the battle, admitted he was sleeping when the battle commenced. But where was he sleeping? He said in his accounts that he was sleeping under the shade of some trees, implying perhaps that he was sleeping out in the open. The few other surviving accounts of his, offers, of his officers, some of whom were very critical of him, did not dispute that statement, but they also didn't say that they saw him sleeping. They may have been in another part of the camp. But one interesting revelation is found in a statement made by a corporal. His name was Juan Reyes in 1836. He said that on the morning of April 21st at 10 a.m., Santa Ana with two detachments of cavalry and aides mounted on horses left the Mexican camp to explore the Texan camp. They returned at 2 p.m. and Santa Ana then commanded the horses to be unsaddled and watered. He then says Santa Ana retired to his choza to rest. And according to Frank, that means a hut or a tent. So as the, we now have a reference now to him retiring to a tent. After the battle then commenced, in Reyes's words, one hour later, <clears throat> he, he personally saw Santa Ana screaming for a horse, but could not obtain one because of the noise, and therefore tried at first to escape on, on foot. So we have at least one eyewitness account, this corporal's account, perhaps the only eyewitness account, other than Santa Ana himself, of a Mexican soldier who saw Santa Ana retire to his tent at least an hour before the battle commenced. But there's no mention here of a woman in the tent or any woman at all behind Mexican lines. <clears throat> but we do have evidence from another document that Emily really was at San Jacinto, or certainly could have been. And recall that Emily's contract was for 12 months. And that year ended in December of 1836. And many of these other contracts also were for one year. And many of those workmen and laborers who brought down from New York and New Haven decided that they wanted to stay in Texas. And they did. Of course, if you were white male, which is most of the workmen were, you were entitled to land and certain privileges. If you were a free black, you were in a special social class that did not give you those privileges. Some of the free blacks that he brought down actually did stay in Texas, including George Cooper, who I mentioned. But Emily, we know, wanted to go home. And in 1837, with both New Washington and Harrisburg destroyed as a result of the San Jacinto campaign, another real estate venture pops up in the neighborhood, a new town called Houston, named for the hero of San Jacinto. 
And the founders of the town, the famous Allen brothers, convinced the Texan government that they needed to move the seat of government, the new capital, to this town of Houston, which they did in early 1837. Emily, therefore, went to the town of Houston, engaged a lawyer, Isaac Moreland, to help her get a passport to leave Texas. Moreland had been an artillery officer in the Texas Army, served at San Jacinto, and became acquainted with Emily at that time, so he said. He agreed to help her by writing a letter for her to present to the Texas Sec Secretary of State, Robert Arian. This remarkable letter was handed to Moreland and preserved in the Department of State's passport records where it can be found today in the Texas State Archives. I got a picture up of it on the screen and here's what it says. Capital Thursday morning to the Honorable Dr. Arian. The bearer of this, Emily D. West, has been since my first acquaintance with her in April of 36, a free woman. She emigrated to this country with Colonel James Morgan from the state of New York in September of 35 and is now anxious to return and wishes a passport. I believe myself that she is entitled to one and has requested me to give her this note to you, your obedient servant, I. N. Moreland. And in the bottom, there's a kind of a PS which says, her free papers were lost at San Jacinto as I am informed and believe in April of 36. So this document confirms that a woman named Emily D. West did exist, was associated with Colonel Morgan. She was a free woman, consistent with being a mulatto, and she was at San Jacinto. And these facts are verified by an army officer who was at the battle who said he first became acquainted with her at that time. But unfortunately, it doesn't say she was in Santa Ana's tent. <laughs> and furthermore, this is the last record we have on Emily D. West. From here, she vanishes from the known historical records. There's no record indicating whether the passport was issued or denied. And that's not uncommon because the passport records are fairly uh, there, there are some gaps in those records in the state archives. We have no census records about Emily D. West, no city directory listings, ship manifest, or any record of her leaving Texas, as far as I know, through my research, although I suspect she did leave Texas at some point. There is one other clue involving this remarkable story that is worth mentioning. In the 1990s, Jim Westwater, while a graduate student at North Carolina State under Jim Crisp, went to the Newberry Library and examined the original papers himself. And he discovered that the story of Emily was originally inserted in Bollard's essay entitled Personal Narrative of His Residence and Travels in Texas. Remember, there were two unpublished essays in the Bollard papers. And what Bollard did was he cut out the, the portion of the page containing that story and pasted it into a page of, his, of the other essay called Texas in 1842, where it appears today. Now the significance of this discovery is that when you examine the page on which the story was initially written, Bollard introduces the story differently from the way he introduces the story in the essay Texas in 1842. Instead of saying that the source was an officer in the army, he says in his personal narrative that it came from, quote, an unpublished letter written by General Houston to a friend. So this strongly suggests that the story originated from Sam Houston, which of course, uh, he would have been in a position to know about it because he spent a week with Santa Ana after the battle and certainly was having many conversations with soldiers at that time on both sides. <clears throat> uh, unfortunately though, Bollard did not transcribe the full letter. There's no transcription of that letter in Bollard's papers at the Newberry. Now, I don't have time to go into full details here, but in my own research of Bollard's papers, it appears to me that the friend who received that letter was a man named John Dorr, who was a law partner of Houston and Nacogdoches. And it was Dorr who showed Houston, Dorr who showed Bollard the letter while they were in Galveston and met in 1842. This is all according to Bollard's journals. He wrote in his journal that Dorr showed Bollard several letters that Houston had written to Dorr, and, and, <clears throat> and, 
And that's, that's the only reference in Ballard's papers where he talks about looking at letters that Sam Houston wrote. <clears throat> so Sam Houston as the author adds an intriguing new twist to the story, but like the other evidence does not definitively prove that Emily D. West was in fact in Santa Ana's tent. But is there enough evidence to prove it based on the documents I've recited to you when all these records are viewed as a whole? Well, we still, at the end of the day, still only have one source, that she was in the tent. But I would say that there's enough circumstantial evidence to provide some corroboration for it. It's plausible, but it can't be dismissed as a hoax or, or a legend. We know that Morgan hired a free woman named Emily D. West in New York City, that she came to Texas with these workmen in the fall of 1835. We know that Santa Ana captured several of Morgan's servants at New Washington, and Emily's passport request indicates that she was at the battle. She was certainly at the right place at the right time, but until we find other source material, I don't think we can say with certainty that she was in Santa Ana's tent. And unfortunately, this is often the great frustration of historical research, as we've heard previously today. There will always be gaps that we wish we could fill, but simply cannot, because the only reason we can know anything about the past is from the records that are left behind. And these records are always incomplete and sometimes wrong. But the absence of definitive proof should not detract Emily and Emily's uh, historical importance. It is a story that matters. It's a story that resonates. And after all, the fact that we have been discussing Emily and her probable role in this remarkable battle and the outcome of the battle over the past 60 years is itself now part of the story of the Battle of San Jacinto. Thank you very much. Thank you.